Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, so today at lunch, I grabbed some food from Timmy's as I have to when I come to Canada. And the napkin let me know that they are 60 years of keeping it fresh. I thought they beat us by 10 years. But at least we have 50 years of keeping it great. But it's a good <laughs> landmark year for a lot of important institutions. Um, earlier, Reagan had talked about standing on the shoulders in the work we do. And certainly, as researchers, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And I want to acknowledge that sometimes I'm fortunate I get to stand next to giants. And you can see that in my co-authors on this talk with Steve, Sasha, Luba, and Tom. And I want to thank them for their contributions to this research over time and put in the context of, of what GLURL has been able to do as a result. So thank the many collaborators we have in the course. This is focusing on work we've done in Lake Michigan. And you know, over going back in the last decades, we've seen some big shifts happen in the Great Lakes. It was in the mid 1980s and zebra mussels arrived. This was representing the first uh, invasion for, for them, first introduction in, in North America. Around this time, they had um, a flurry of activity was starting. The mussels are being found more and more places. And in early 1989, uh, Tom Nalepo was the benthic ecologist for GLURL at the time. And he was invited to join a meeting um, about this new invasion, the first North America zebra mussel meeting. He was one of 12 people at this meeting. And here's a great vintage picture that Tom provided. And his impression of going to the meeting was after seeing videos and pics of mussels along the north shore of Lake Erie in early 1989, I immediately thought nothing is ever going to be the same. And certainly that was, uh, was very uh, brilliant of him to think that in the moment because the lakes are, you see the Great Lakes before mussels and the Great Lakes after. So I'm gonna be talking about the long-term data we have and, um, and look, looking at it from multiple aspects of what we've learned about mussels over time. So um, I, I'll mention too that, you know, going back to 1989, this was an important point of the invasion. These maps from the USGS NAS uh, system, they have this nice series of maps that they, they um, animate. And these maps show that in 1989, Zebra mussels that are on the left had already really started to spread through Lake uh, Erie and made it into other lakes. And then that the little lone dot on the right side, that's a quagga mussel, and that was the first record of quagga mussels. At this time, zebra mussels were attaching to everything they could attach to. They're attaching to native mussels and causing issues. They're attaching to infrastructure and causing issues for humans. And so this was a this was a, like a very big time, and things are about to boom. So let's go five years into the future. That's a lot of progress to make in five years for a distribution of an invasive species. And you can see that quagga mussels were also spreading, focused more within the lakes. Let's go five years again. And what's notable here is quagga mussels appear in Lake Michigan. And that's what I'll be really focusing on today. And I'll tell you right now, Lake, um, quagga mussels love Lake Michigan and they do very well. Five years later, they've made it throughout. Meanwhile, zebra mussels keep spreading further. They are outside of the Great Lakes Basin. They're in river systems. They're in small inland lakes. And that just continues. Notable in 2014 is uh, zebra mussels appear in Lake Winnipeg. So that's now a, that's been a major invasion that they've had to deal with. And going to now more modern times, this more recent, the most recent, close to recent distribution, quagga mussels more concentrated within the lakes, zebra mussels more within the region, watersheds, and both species are now found throughout North America. So during this time, you know, um, there is a, a program, uh, GLURL established its program um, for benthic monitoring throughout the, this whole part and even predating this invasion. And that's what's so wonderful about long-term, so wonderful about long-term benthic monitoring. It's the only way that we can catch things before and know what it was like before and after. So this is a nonlinear scale. Uh, time scale that I'll go through quickly to give an idea of the benthic monitoring programs. The earliest surveys were started in the 1930s and 1960s. And when I saw these names, now I know why we have sites that start with EG and sites that start with A, because it's like, oh, that's the people who are doing the sites at that time. And that can sometimes tell you why they're, you get the odd names for your site codes. Um, in 1980, when early in Tom's position, he then established a Southern Basin program. And his goal was, 
Okay, it's since 1960s, we've seen nutrient reductions. How are the benthos responding? And he had this established this program that was two consecutive years every five years. And he was planning to just do that, march through, do it in the Southern Basin, take advantage of that long-term data. But then Dreisenids arrive in the 80s. So in 1990, by mid 1990s, they were starting to see declines in Dipariah, a very important native amphipod. And that's when they decided to do old whole lake surveys began at that time. It's also in the 1990s that the Southern Basin Survey switched to being annual instead of every five years. Starting in 2010, these annual surveys became part of the CSMI cycle. And I, I didn't put it on here, but um, I invaded the Glural Benthos program in 2014. So I'm, I'm kind of towards the end of this timeline. And then uh, 2015 and onward, that's when um, Buffalo State became involved with the CSMI cycle. And then they led the CSMI Whole Lake Survey in 2021. So here I get to walk you through, these are these classic blue density maps that we've been producing for a while to start out to show you know, the whole lake survey when it started, uh, zebra mussels were already fairly established, but not totally established throughout the lake. Quagga mussels, not on the scene yet. In, 20, in five years to the year 2000, uh, zebra mussels made excellent progress. They're mostly in the near shore zone. They've made it all the way around the lake, but note that quagga mussels, there's that early arrival in the north. This will blow your mind. Look at this. So quagga mussels from that little bit to like a completely blue and dark blue map, darker color, higher density. And not only are they uh, high density and made it around the lake, they made it deeper than zebra mussels have. So we see that zebra mussels are, are quagga mussels are much more suited for the environment of Lake Michigan than zebra mussels. And then the ne next 15 years of data show that zebra mussels are they were displaced almost entirely. We barely, we might find one zebra mussel in this entire survey in a given year, and another year we won't find any. They're that rare. Meanwhile, quagga mussels have continued. They um, are, are at all depths and have con um, pretty much uh, stabilized in their densities. Now, a lot can happen in five years. I, I've been doing things in five-year steps to make a point. A lot can happen in between. So we're going to look now to the annual glural data, fill in those gaps a little. So these are, uh, the last maps are in, in density. Now I'm switching to the currency of biomass. So this is biomass of just tissue, ash-free dry weight. And this is a consistent measure that the GLURL programs use for biomass over time. I'm going to bring in one depth zone at a time because my theme going forward now in the talk is that depth matters. So in the shallow sites of 16 to 30 meters, you can see that you have, it bounces up and down. It never really took off or crashed. And we just see kind of these consistent bumpy levels, some years high levels of standard um, variability around the mean. Now contrast this to go a little deeper, 31 to 50 meters. And I'll point out here again, this is only quagga mussels. I didn't put zebras on this um, mat, on this graph. It's just quagga mussels. Um, that they exploded. So in just over five years, they went from zero up to peak biomass levels in that short time. But then in the few years that followed, they came back down to about half of the peak and have been bouncing around that value ever since. If you go to the next step deeper from 51 to 90 meters, it's a, a little time delay, but you get that increase in density, not as much of a decline. And again, the mean is just bouncing around. And then contrast this with the deepest muscles. Now the deep zone is very important because that's the high, um, most of the, the area of the lake is in this deep profundal zone. Slow, steady approach to what looks like the, you know, the number of muscles that Lake Michigan can support at that depth and just bouncing around slightly with little variation year to year. So when you put this together into a depth weighted mean, it shows that ever since 2010, we haven't had that much change in the depth weighted mean over time. And in the mid depths, it's typically above that mean and the most shallow and the deepest depths, it's generally below that overall lake weighted mean. So some people, they look at that graph and they say, oh, muscles were here and they've come way down. So they, is it, they're not as much of a problem anymore. This is what the new, this is where they're at. This is what it looks like 
to at um, about that 10 grams um, of biomass per meter squared in Lake Michigan. This is just taken two years ago. And many thanks to the Canadian documentary team, Inspired Planet Productions. They took this footage and it's a still from the most cinematic capture of a ponard grab I've ever seen. You, you can go on their site, I think, and find this. It's amazing. I almost, I almost cried when I saw it. Um, but yeah, it, this is a, a sea of mussels. They're still by far the dominant benthos, the most dominant benthos ever to, that, to be in the lake biomass wise. So let's back that claim up with data. This is from Nalepa's long-term program when he was doing the Southern Basin um, he was doing every two, year, two years, every five years. And in 1990, when he started the program, the lake was dominated by Dipariya in green. Again, that important native amphipod. The mussels arrive midpoint when zebras were there. You're, you're starting to see declines in Dipariya. And then fast forward to 2015, where Dreisina are the number one species. And in, in both times, the number two species is always oligochaetes. Oligochaetes have fared well, they, they stay as number two, but it's now Dreisina instead of Dipraya. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and I want to just look at what's been happening over time and what's happening currently and looking to the future from multiple angles using other sources of data outside of just the, the long-term monitoring. So first let's start with quagga mussel body condition. We measure body condition because it can indicate the nutritional status of the muscles. It can also indicate their reproductive status um, and, then their, and their nutritional state as well. Um, we have been in conjunction with the CSMI cycle ever since 2015. We've been measuring lake-wide quagga mussel density, catching all depth zones, catching um, you know north, south, east, west within the lakes. And many of the lakes, except for Lake Erie so far, have been measured twice. So we can look at changes over time. Um, and Lake Erie will be done this summer. So I put up the code here because it is archived data. It's a data set that we will add to every year that we do these surveys as part of CSMI. And I just want to, I'm happy for people to use that as a resource and happy to talk about it anytime. And with here focusing on the Lake Michigan data, what we found um, comparing 2015 in the dark blue bars and 2021 in the light blue bars is there has been a significant decline over time. But back to this theme of depth matters, the, um, the shallow muscles, they have the heaviest, um, they're he I mean, relatively more tissue than at the other depths of other muscles. And then um, the lowest body condition is at the mid depth sites where we also see highest density could be higher competition for food that is there. And then the intermediate is the 90 meter muscles. So depth matters also for muscle growth because this is, you know, the body condition is seeing how are the muscles doing individually and how does that, what can that tell you about the population and what's happening? Well, here the growth that we see of muscles also indicates and helps explain this, this population trends that we've seen over time. Uh, the data here are from a published paper on Lake Ontario, where we looked at one year in the, in the field growth of caged mussels at 15, 45, and 90 meters. At 90 meters, they grew one-tenth as much as they did at 15 meters. Um, we have a similar study going on right now in Lake Michigan, so I, I look forward to the future having an, a graph that looks similar to this for Lake Michigan. All points, all, all evidence points to the fact that we, we will. Now, if they're growing slowly, what are they doing for the next generation? We'll say that. So they have, um, ev we have evidence as new um, measurements we just started taking last summer. They have reduced reproductive activity. I've been seeing, uh, you know, anecdotally, I've been observing this over the last 10 years of assessing their reproduction seasonally. But I decided I'm going to, I'm going to start dissecting out the reproductive tissue from the rest of it and, and get a proportion. And let's get some numbers to it instead of all these notes I've been scribbling down. And it looks pretty clear, the lightest bars are the shallow sites. If you look that um, you always have more uh, amount of proportion of reproductive tissue in the shallow muscles than you do in the other sites. It's most pronounced in July when muscles are most reproductively active. And then that difference, it, it narrows in the other months, but the shallow muscles always produce more. So while the shallow muscles have a lower density in biomass than the other zones, they have greater reproductive um, 
capacity and could have great, um, greater contribution for villagers. So it's important to keep that in mind. And then a the last angle of look at for, for mussels is what clues can we get from their size distributions over time? In these figures, the yellow is 2023. So that's the, what's closest to you is, is the current. And then going back in the darker colors, that's going back in time. In the near shore, these mussels have capacity for a lot of growth, but they are small year after year after year. And this is a high energy shifting substrate area and you're likely to have turnover in the population. So that I explains, and this is the common pattern we see in the shallow sites. In the mid depth, there's a steady increase in the in the media or the, you know, the median length is increasing over time. That if I eyeball it, I'm like that's kind of close to the growth rates that we're finding for these mussels. And what's really notable here, lack of small mussels. You don't have the next mussels coming up behind it. And this has been observed in eastern Lake Erie as well. The mussels just keep getting bigger. Well, who's going to replace them? So like, what, what's the population gonna be in 10 years? So this is very important to pay attention to. And then for the deepest mussels, you also have more large mussels. It's been very gradual change, but you still have small mussels. So that shows continued um, replenishment and uh, nothing that seems to be interfering with their recruitment. Very key. So then the last data I'll wrap up here, speaking of recruitment, we have to talk about mussel villagers. This is a component that hasn't gotten um, as much attention, but is getting more attention now. I'm looking forward to um, Lake Michigan CSMI 2025. We wanna put a lot more focus on villagers. And here we're seeing evidence of synchronized peaks of two spawning events. If you look at both the density and um, each, each line here is a different depth, both the density and the length, it, it's evidence for synchronized peaks. Um, and this, these data are from Steve Pothoven. He also, with our long-term research program, he measures this over time, and he's identified there's a six to seven year cycle of high villager years, followed by a lull, high villager year, and a lull. And this could have clear implications for what kind of stock are you getting to replenish the mussels. So putting this next to our size distribution data, we'll have, um, we see a general trend this is again, the dark colors are going back in time, going towards yellow is current. Um, you see a decline in the number of small mussels over time at most depth zones. Well, we've seen a decline in that period. We've had a period um, up to 2022 of low villager production. And this is, based, this is just from the 15 meter site, but we use that as a, as a proxy. And look at these two years before I move on from villagers. 2016, gangbusters year for villagers. 2016 in the near shore had a high number of small mussels settled out, or the neck the following year, 2017 had high mussels. So in going forward, a lot of these data have been collected by the trusty, sometimes rusty mechanical ponar. And we just, um, I mean, it's a classic piece of equipment and it's very consistent, but going forward, it's good to develop new methods. So I wanna highlight a method that has been developed by uh, Karatayev and Barlakova um, Sasha just presented on this an hour ago in, in their session, and it's using uh, this benthic drop-down camera to analyze images. It's a way to get near real-time assessments at the bottom, and they see it as a very reliable supplement to other sources of benthic data. So going forward, I'll kind of leave it on this as we, we wrap up. Um, we have all this monitoring experimental data. We can put it together and support a lot of collaborative efforts. I want to promote the Invasive Muscle Collaborative. Um, we have multi, um, in bringing everyone together around Drycenids, we've come up with this multi-partner effort to control muscles in a high value habitat, such as a project in Northern Michigan and Northern Huron to remove muscles in uh, Lake Whitefish spawning grounds. And then we're looking to use these data for habitat population modeling and also applying them to a dynamic energy budget modeling framework. So here's the field pictures everyone's waiting for. Um, I want to thank all my collaborators, all the hard work people have been put in on boats. And I know I'm, it's just hit 20 minutes. Thank you for your attention. And I'd love to talk to anyone at the break. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. We actually have time for uh, one question, I think. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. 
Thanks, Ashley. Um, I guess I was just thinking uh, at the beginning of your talk when you were talking about the surveys you've been doing and that like the all of Lake Michigan is dominated by quagga mussels. How far inshore were you sampling for yeah. zebra mussels? Or are they, I, I can't imagine they're completely out of the system. I'm glad you brought that up. So the survey that we have, the most shallow site is 16 meters. And so if you are very near shore, if you are at the mouth of a harbor, if you're on a pier, it'll still be dominant zebra mussels or about 50-50. So they're very, there's very much coexistence in more shallow, very shallow near shore warmer areas. Yep. But our, our survey is, is um, biased towards soft areas where you can plunge a ponar grab into it. So that, that's biased towards quaggas with that. 